Hello, everyone, and welcome. Hi, Spencer. Thank you so much for being here today. My first LinkedIn Live, so I'm very grateful to have you. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you, Joyce? It's great to be here. Great to be with everybody. Yes, and thank you so much to everybody who has registered. And I know it's going to take a couple minutes for people to sign on. So before I formally introduce myself and Spencer, I just want to explain to you or share with you that I became familiar with Spencer's work because we're both Sounds True authors. And Sounds True is, if you're not familiar, a publisher who specializes in mindfulness. And when I started reading Spencer's books and listening to his audiobooks, I was like, wow, I like this guy. Uh, Spencer, the way that you think about mindfulness and money is so aligned with how I think about it. And what I find so interesting is that you're coming at it from your experience as a financial advisor and wealth advisor. And I've come to those conclusions as a psychotherapist working with my clients about the psychology of money. Yet we've arrived at very similar ideas and we're both entrepreneurs and I believe we all specialize in our own issues. So I imagine we each have a money story that led us to this work. And I'm just really honored and appreciative because you're one of my heroes. Mm. I really appreciate your generosity in endorsing my book as a first time author. That meant a lot. And uh, so I hold a special place in my heart for you. And I'm I love your work. I'm super excited that we're doing this Sounds True event coming up soon. So thank you for that. And as people are logging on, I want to share that throughout this presentation, I really want you to post your questions, post your comments. Spencer and I are going to have some time at the end where we're going to answer your questions. And we do have the comments section up, so we'll do our best to kind of answer questions as they come through. And we're excited. Our hope and intention really is to inspire you to practice mindfulness for your own well-being personally, professionally, and financially. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce myself, and then I'll introduce Spencer, our guest of honor, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm Joyce Martyr. I've been a licensed psychotherapist for about 25 years. I founded, built, and successfully sold Urban Balance, which is a multi-million dollar national outpatient mental health company. I am a keynote speaker and corporate trainer talking about mental health and financial health. And I'm the author of the recent book, The Financial Mindset Fix. And Spencer Sherman is an MBA and CFP. He is a leading financial advisor, author, and public speaker. Spencer is renowned for his mindfulness-based approach to money. As the founder and former CEO of Abacus, a values-driven dri financial consulting firm managing over $3 billion in assets. Wow, Spencer, that's huge. Spencer has transformed the lives of his clients and ha helped them to achieve financial success on their own terms. So thank you again, Spencer, and welcome. Thank you, Joyce. It is great to be here with you. And I certainly so much admire your work. Your clarity on talking about the psychology of money is so clear. And I'm just, I'm, we're all going to benefit today from listening to you uh, because what I've, I think we're on the same page with this, that while the financial stuff is so important, the numbers are important. Once you have this basic knowledge of the numbers of finances, it's really this psychology, this emotional awareness that really drives success. And that's one of the things that I love about your work is you bring that forward. Thank you so much. I mean, you're a financial expert. You know the all the strategies and best practices. I am not. But what I've realized is that 
basically the basics of money management really isn't rocket science. We know we need to earn more than what we spend and we need to save and invest for the future. But just like with exercise or healthy eating, we self-sabotage yes. and it's our psychology, it's our thoughts, it's our belief systems, it's our emotions around money. It's our relationship with money and the way we set financial boundaries or don't in our relationships. So I'd like to ask you, Spencer, yes. I mentioned yes. that. I just want to reiterate what you said, that everyone here, if you're someone who was, was not a math major like me or into economics, doesn't feel comfortable, maybe gets nervous around numbers and financial topics, I just want to say that there is all this evidence that people who know very little about finances, who don't have a lot of aptitude with with for numbers can actually be very successful, even more successful than those of us who are math majors or have PhDs in finance. And the reason is, is that if like, like Joyce was, you were just saying, when we follow the simple guidelines towards success with our finances, we're successful. And the people that know a lot, sometimes all that extra knowledge leads them to second guess or play around with those simple guidelines. And I think that, you know, the analogies like you made to exercise are very apt here. Absolutely. And myself as a woman and having counseled so many people from various walks of life, as women, I think we're told that we're not good at math since mm. we're little girls. And I'm excited that more women are going into finance, but it is a male dominated industry. And as I counsel couples, so many couples have inequity in their financial literacy. So mm. I love really promoting everyone to become financially literate. Yes. And I also noticed in my trainings that sometimes certain professions, like therapists, obviously I'm a therapist, are more likely to have people who are financially avoidant. Yes, yes. You know, I'm so glad you mentioned the word women, because I think my next book should be Invest Like a Woman, because the studies show that women perform way better than men. The New York Times did, did compiled some studies and it's not even close, the comparison between men and women when it comes to investment performance, women knock it out of the park. That's amazing. How interesting yeah. is that? And confidence inspiring. Yes. So Spencer, I wanna ask you, uh, I mentioned earlier that I believe as healers and teachers, advisors, that we all come into our careers for a personal reason. So I'm wondering if you could share with us a little bit about your money story and how that led you into your career. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I was, well, I had a father who was very driven around success, business success. And of course I rebelled and said, I had, want nothing to do with, with money. And then um, I discovered this field of financial advising that really combines psychology and money. And I was interested in psychology. So it seemed like the perfect field to get into. And then something happened. Uh, so it, I was just a year into the profession. Uh, I was working in Philadelphia as, as a financial advisor and there was a fire in the building. Oh. And I was watching this, building burn. And as they were putting out the fire, I had a panic attack. Mm. And I, I, the panic attack was because my laptop was in that building. And the thoughts in my head at that moment were that my whole life is in that building. Even though I'm standing here safe outside, I felt like my life was in that building. I mean, it was the craziest, you know, kind of irrational thoughts I, one could have. And somehow I convinced the fire marshal to escort me into the building to retrieve my laptop, which of course was completely worthless. It was completely water drenched uh, beyond repair. And that was such a wake up call for me because I think what, what I learned from that, and what I got in touch with is that the condition that I had around money growing up was that money is more important than anything. And when one has that kind of conditioning, that 
any kind of conditioning where you have these fixed beliefs around money, that money is so important, more, more important than anything, one could do impulsive things like that. So here I risk my life, I risk my future earnings just to retrieve, you know, this, this laptop. And that was the catalyst for me, Joyce, uh, to, to realize that there's so much more going on with money than just the numbers. Here I am, this, this you know, Wharton MBA, and yet I don't know any better than to realize my life is worth so much more than that laptop. So it, it was the catalyst for me to start doing meditation retreats. Uh, and I started doing them in my early 20s. I started doing these long, silent meditation retreats because I knew that I came from a background that was all about numbers, all about business. And I had zero emotional intelligence or a negative amount. And I wanted to cultivate that. And I, friends of mine told me about meditation and it just... It, I just had this sense that that was the path for me, that that was going to help me feel the pain that I was avoiding my whole childhood. Wow. What a powerful story. And I really like how that's an example of sometimes for most of us or many of us, our identity with our work or our identity with our title, our finances, our bank account, all those externals kind of eclipse our authentic self, our soul, our real be being, like what's really important in life. And the financial part can eclipse that. And the financial part is related to our ego, our mind's understanding of ourself. When our essence is our deeper, wiser self and mindfulness practices really help us detach from ego and connect with that higher, deeper self, our inner light. Mm. And it helps us get so much clearer on, clearer on what's important and is so transformative personally, professionally, and financially. Yeah. So like- I wish you, you were there with me, Joyce. <laughs> <laughs> I could have counseled you. You would have counseled me. I mean, that's so beautiful what you just said. And, you know, I want to say that, you know, my story was kind of dramatic, but, but what- what I've seen, you know, in myself following, following that, because this has been a work in process. And what I see with thousands of clients and students is these, these fixed beliefs that we grip to have us do things like, you know, overspend or in, invest in overly speculative, risky things where we lose all our money, um, doing things just as you said, just because we're sort of identified with, I think you use the word ego, with that, with, with you know, somehow that that's more important than our day-to-day -day well being. Yes, absolutely. So I, you talked a little bit about how you came into mindfulness meditation and how that was so helpful to you. How has it specifically transformed your relationship with money? Oh, well, it's, you know, I sometimes say that it's not so polite to interrupt somebody else, but it's fine to interrupt yourself. It's fine to interrupt your own ruminations, uh, your own, you know, tr trains of thought of worry um, or fantasy. And that's what often happens to me is, you know, that mind. And even now, even after doing many, many meditation retreats, the mind, the chatter hasn't changed so much, but what has changed is it's no longer controlling me, that chatter. It's more in the background. I see it. That's what mindfulness has helped me do is to see the chatter, to see the fantasy thought when someone says to me, hey, I have this investment that's going to, you know, tenfold your money in a year. I can feel that gripping to it, that what if I don't do it? I'm going to have all this FOMO. I'm going to look bad if I don't do it. And I can just be with that and then access the wisdom that's within each of us. It's there, but it gets clouded over by these emotions. So, you know, that's one way. I mean, I think mindfulness has just given me an anchor like in my life so that I'm not so swayed by the inevitable ups and downs and changes. And I think that's, you know, the other thing about finances is that it'd be nice if everything just kept going up, if we kept getting younger 
and our bank accounts kept getting larger, but it doesn't always go that way. Uh, and mindfulness has been very powerful in terms of me finding my equanimity. And then that all of this has helped me immensely in the business world, you know, not be reactive. And I'm thinking about an email that I got recently from a business partner. And I just noticed myself react to this email and I wanted to fire an email back. And that's what I used to do. And then I just took a pause and I just felt into it. And I said, you know, who knows what was really going on with, with my business partner who sent this email. And I'm just gonna let it be for, for a day. The next day, my business partner writes back and apologizes and says he sent that email without reviewing it. So it's like that, that saved me. It saved me from a whole confrontation with my business partner. Absolutely. And so I completely agree that mindfulness, you know, helps us all personally, professionally, and financially. So my money story, which I know I've shared with you before, my father grew up during the Great Depression. And so understandably, he had a scarcity mindset about money, which was rooted in fear that there weren't enough resources to go around. He lived in the inner city of Cleveland in a small apartment with multiple family members. Mm -hmm. And so he was the first person in his family to go to college. And even though he was successful in his career, he had a scarcity mindset and tremendous financial anxiety. Mm -hmm. He was unemployed during most of my adolescence and dealt with clinical depression he was a binge eater, kind of self-treating the anxiety that he was experiencing about money. And I experienced a lot of shame and worry about money. Mm -hmm. So it was confusing because we lived in a nice home and neighborhood, but there was a lot of worry about how my parents were going to pay for my three siblings college, how they were going to be able to retire. I was, I was young at that point. And so I believe as a therapist that we all recreate what is familiar to us until we, we become conscious and we choose something different. So as an entrepreneur, I started my business with $500, 50,000 of student loan debt, built my business one therapist and client at a time and ended up in cash flow hell. I had insomnia and panic attacks mm -hmm. and extreme financial anxiety. Mm -hmm. And really that mirrored what my dad went yeah. through, where it looked okay on the outside, but really was horribly anxiety provoking. And it was then that I turned to mindfulness. Mm -hmm. Obviously as a therapist, I've done a lot of my own work on my psychology of money, but mindfulness, and for those of you who haven't practiced, you know, mindfulness is rooted in Zen Buddhism, but it's not religious. It's a philosophy that when we bring our attention to the present moment, we can facilitate peace and calm. So a lot of us worry and second guess and ruminate about financial decisions of the past, or we worry about the uncertainty of the future, especially during these times of economic uncertainty, when usually peace can be found in the present moment. So mindfulness practices include deep breathing, meditation, which, which Spencer has mentioned, yoga, which is meditation with movement. I practice meditation and yoga. Connecting with nature is another way to practice mindfulness. So I want to hear from you in the comments, attendees. How familiar are you with mindfulness? How has it changed your life? How often do you practice? What do you find helpful? I love apps like Calm and Headspace and Peloton even has a mindfulness component to their app. And it really can help you. The research says it helps with our physical health, our mental health, our financial health. It helps with our emotional intelligence, which of course is a big key in business. So uh, thank you so much for sharing that, Spencer. And, you know, I think, do you see a lot of people in your practice dealing with money anxiety during this financial climate? Yeah, I mean, it's, 
I mean, I'm glad you mentioned about your father and growing up in the Great Depression, because that's something to take into account is when did you grow up? When did your ancestors grow up? That all informs our conditioning with money. And yeah, I think that this this scarcity consciousness that you spoke about with your father, you know, which the underside of scarcity is that really there's this fear, this fear of not enough that comes through and it's universal. I mean, I see it with clients who don't have enough, literally don't have enough. And I see it with clients who have tens of millions of dollars and there's still that anxiety. I mean, it's all kind. it's the anxiety that what if, something really bad, unexpected happens, or what if I don't use this money well? So it, it's a universal feeling, that anxiety. I think it's, it's almost like um, one client once said, said to me at one moment, you know, after working with you, I'm at this place where I noticed I have some days where I'm not feeling anxious and now I'm worried about like not feeling what I'm used to feeling. <laughs> you know, it's so much a part of who we are that it takes something to undo that conditioning. And I think that that anxiety is actually a doorway. You know, if we can actually be with the anxiety, if we can feel the sensations of the anxiety, not the thoughts, let go of the thoughts about the anxiety, the, the fears that come up and actually feel, feel how does it express itself in the body, that anxiety, and to tune into that we're less likely to act out from that anxiety and, you know, do something or say something to someone that comes from that very fearful place. Absolutely. As we practice mindfulness, like you said, we can begin to notice our thoughts and notice our feelings and learn to be consciously responsive responsive rather than emotionally reactive. Like you were going to be with yes. firing back an email to your, your yes. partner. Yes. We gain this resilience, this strength to actually sit with some of the difficulty. So we don't, we're not always in this loop of trying to temporarily get rid of an uncomfortable feeling like go maybe going out and buying something or eating something or whatever we might do to, to just, to, you know, get rid of that feeling, but it's going to keep coming back. It's like pushing a, a inflated um, a ball, you know, under the water It's going to keep rising up again. Uh, so the way through that, and this is why anxiety can actually be, I don't know, in some ways, a, like this, this opportunity, we can see it as because that anxiety is telling us, oh, wow, there's something here for me to address. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And money anxiety is so common. And like you said, people can experience it really from both ends of the spectrum. I've counseled people in community mental health, yeah. people at, at methadone maintenance clinics that were dealing with extreme poverty, and also counseled people with tens of millions, like you said. And it's it may be different uh, for the people with millions, a lot of that might be irrational and it might have to do with past financial trauma. And as you mentioned, that can be intergenerational. So if, if your parents or grandparents went through, you know, the Holocaust or some genocide or slavery or extreme financial traumas, or perhaps they lost a business or had to uh, file bankruptcy, that can trickle down into your own financial belief systems. And so having these uh, practices really can help people deal with financial trauma. So financial traumas include unemployment, the loss of a business, um, financial loss from divorce or an unexpected health issue. It can include even racism, sexism, marginalization for the LGBTQIA plus population because there's financial discrimination, which is traumatic. And people who have general anxiety, um, and again, as a therapist, I think we all have mental health just like we have physical health. So if we deal with anxiety or depression or some other mental health issue, we're more likely to experience money, money anxiety. 
Yeah. yeah. So Spencer, could you share a couple of practical ways for our attendees to apply mindfulness to money? Yes. Yes. So I think, I mean, one is is what is what I just mentioned is as you're sitting here, if you're experiencing some stress around money, some difficulty, see if you can feel what that stress is like instead of think about what that stress is like in the in words. See if you can contact the sensations of the stress and just be with them as you're listening to this. That's helpful. And then I started teaching something I call the money breath, which mm -hmm. is which is just an inhale through the nose and exhale through the mouth. The exhale is twice as long as the inhale. And it's a way of getting oxygen to the brain because when we're in that stressed anxiety place, we're in that fight, fight, flight mode, we're in that what's called the sympathetic nervous system, not the parasympathetic nervous system. And in that in that hyped up nervous system, we're not getting oxygen into the bloodstream. No wonder why the brain doesn't function well and can't make a, a wise financial decision. It's sort of what I was saying before, we are capable, each of us here are capable of making wise financial decisions. Sometimes it's just a matter of slowing down and getting some oxygen to the brain. Absolutely. And I agree that when we do breath work or meditation, it's like a reboot for the mind, the body, and the spirit, just yeah. like computers, our brains are, you know, yeah. operating systems. And sometimes we, when we have too many screens open, we glitch and we become overwhelmed. Yeah. So by practicing mindfulness in whatever way works for you, and it might be once a week, it might be a few times a week, but wow, it can really be transformative if you practice even a few minutes most days. And it, yeah. yes, and it doesn't have to, and you don't have to make it like a thing. It can just be like in 30 seconds when you're waiting for your coffee at the, at the um, cafe that you just, you just be quiet for 30 seconds. You just notice what's happening inside. You interrupt a train of thought. That is a mo powerful moment of mindfulness. Um, and the other thing, Joyce, I want to say is, um, is just the crazy thing about money that makes it so much harder than other topics is you can talk about exercise with people and other topics, but it's really hard to talk about money with people. It's just so, it, there's just no forum for it. And I think one of the things that we've been up to in our lives, Joyce, is, is creating forums for people, safe forums, like this kind of an event where you can express yourself authentically around money, this helps decrease that money anxiety. Um, Joyce and I are in a program with Sounds True that begins tomorrow, the inner dimensions of money, which is really powerful. And there's going to be all these breakout room opportunities to dialogue with someone in a very safe, confidential way about the stuff that you feel all the shame around because that shame lives in isolation. It dies when we start to share it with others. Absolutely, absolutely. And so I'm so excited about the Inner Dimensions of Money course and excited to be with you and Ra Goddess and Judy Wilkins-Smith. And for attendees who are here today, registration still going on. When Spencer and I are done, we will both share some resources in the comments. And so you can check that out. And there's a discount with a coupon code, MONEY50, and you'll get 50% off of That Sounds True course, which is an eight-week course. It's phenomenal. I'm super honored and excited to be participating in it. And so, yes, I think there's so many ways we can apply mindfulness to money. So getting out of our head and the mind chatter and the negative self-talk the self-sabotage that we can create financially and silence our inner saboteur, that voice in our head that, you know, might have scarcity mindset, might put us down, tell us somehow we're not enough, that fuels anxiety and stress. And instead, connect with the breath, connect with the senses, become aware of the feelings that you have in your body that are waves of energy and really wrapping yourself with loving self-compassion. If you've made financial mistakes like I have, I made a thousand mistakes in my business. I ended up in cash flow hell. 
mm-hmm. and was so stressed out. And it was through techniques from my clinical training and techniques from mindfulness that really helped me recover. And Spencer, I agree, we're not taught to talk about money. Many of us are taught that talking about money is impolite or that it's something very, very private and that we shouldn't share it with anybody else. But then we're operating in silos and we're comparing our insides to other people's outsides. And as a therapist for 25 years, I can tell you most of us have self-esteem issues to some extent or another. And we also have financial issues. And like you said, it could be on any end of the spectrum. So mindfulness strategies that I personally practice around money are really getting out of my head and into my body and checking in with my heart and my gut. So for example, when I was selling my business, I had 50 prospective buyers and eight offers. And when I sat with the prospective buyers, I not only listened to what they were saying, but I checked in with the wisdom of my body and my intuition to really become aware that for some of them, I didn't believe them. I didn't believe what they were saying. I didn't trust them. Mm -hmm. Something was out of alignment. And I really believe that mindfulness helped me to make a good decision Or when I was recovering from being in financial distress and then eventually sold my business for more money than I would have ever imagined making in a lifetime, I had to use a lot of mindfulness strategies to cope, you know, to compartmentalize Mm -hmm. the worry and fear and to have mantras to get me through it. And, you know, this too shall pass. And most importantly, accessing support. So reaching out to advisors like you, a good accountant, uh, legal professionals, and speaking up wasn't until I said, oh my gosh, I screwed up and I need help that my life and my business began to change. Yeah, I love that, that you, you, you sought help, you took action, you got out of the anxiety, out of the worry, out of the rumination and took some action. That's what I think so much of it is about is engagement. And, you know, we spoke about, yeah, the difficulty of you know, being able to discuss this, um, this arena with anybody. Um, I speak about having a, a money uh, ally in your life, uh, uh, someone who you can, who you can be sounding boards for each other. I, we talk about that in the program that we're starting tomorrow, how to, how to cultivate a money ally. I mean, these are the things that are going to undo like decades of conditioning for us where we learn things in childhood at a time when money was very abstract and confusing. They got locked into our brains and then we're living in silos as adults. And of course, then we say, well, why do I keep doing that? Well, we've been, we've been training ourselves for a long time and then not able to talk about it with anybody. So that's also the good news that I think the bar is low with money. I mean, we've put so little mindful attention on money, that if you just ratchet that up just a little bit, just spend a couple of minutes a day of mindful attention on your, how you're responding to your finances, you might see a lot of changes in your life. I certainly did. And we can move from financial avoidance or financial denial to fiscal consciousness. So move from a place of blame to responsibility, from shame to acceptance, and from disempowerment to empowerment. And mindfulness can really help us do that with loving self-compassion and self-forgiveness and knowing that we're all works in progress. None of us is perfect. And when we put our attention to our finances, our lives can change dramatically. And of course, as a therapist, I really believe that our relationship with ourself sets the tone for our financial wellness. So we need to embrace our worth and we need to take responsibility for ourselves and empower ourselves to align our unique gifts with a need in the world to the greatest extent possible and negotiate 
You know, as my clients make progress in therapy, they put themselves out in the world with more confidence, more assertiveness. They're willing to expand their comfort zone rather than keeping their life small. And there's a huge financial return when they negotiate. So self-worth and net worth are very much related. And so when we work on ourselves personally, psycho-spiritually through mindfulness, there's a financial benefit. Yeah. 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 The, that's the unfortunate thing about our culture, especially the Western culture, that somehow we've equated um, net worth to be equal to self-worth. Self and I'm here to say your self-worth is infinitely greater than your net worth. There's just no comparison. And I've never had anybody who's wanted a, an additional significant health challenge um, and a billion dollars. Nobody wants that deal. Uh, so that has to tell you something that your health, your sense of humor, your creativity, your intelligence, your presence, all of that's worth way more than any amount of money. Amen. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And going back to that ego and essence, our essence, our true being is really who we are. Our money is how we are and it's temporary. I mean, I'm sure Spencer, you've worked with clients and I have too that were very financially successful and then lost everything. 16% um, yeah. of suicides tragically are financially driven. And so, you mm -hmm. know, when, when people equate their worth with their money, yeah. it can have dire consequences. It can have dire consequences. And, and this is, you know, the unfortunate thing. It's, we, it's, it's gotten worse today because the financial news is every moment. I mean, it used to be maybe it was once a day. I mean, before that, it was even less frequently. But now you see, you can see your net worth rising and falling at every moment, and it makes us, it you know, it it's not healthy for the brain. Getting all those reminders of how we're doing, both on the plus side and the negative side, it's like we're, we're looking for the external for this validation, where where. We're, we're equating that net self-worth with the net worth. We're letting ourselves be hijacked by the vagaries of the financial, of our financial lives. And, you know, one of the things I say is, is there's this great quote that I love from Jean-Jacques Rousseau, um, a Swiss philosopher who said, patience is bitter, but its fruit is sweet. And that quote has gotten me through so much because when you look at your finances over the last 5, 10, 15, 20 years, what you'll see probably is a much, much calmer or much more positive graph than what happened in the last day, the last week, the last month, the last year. Everybody's life has those ups and downs along the way. I mean, that's just part of it. It's that impermanence of life that the best of us lose income or jobs or lose money in the markets. It's just part of a uh, part of our financial lives. Absolutely. And Spencer, you said like irrationally, most of us, we expect progress to be linear. Yes. But life doesn't work that way. The stock market doesn't work yes. that way. We have job losses. We have setbacks. There's yes. economic forces at play. And so mindfulness, when we practice it, it helps us cultivate mental and financial resilience yeah. to be able to withstand those challenges and to bounce back and to persevere. And when we have a growth mindset, we're better able to zoom out and see the big picture and say, oh my gosh, okay, over the past 20 years, my portfolio has grown rather than, oh my gosh, in the last yeah. month, it's tanked. Yes. And so I always recommend detachment, which is a healthy mindfulness strategy, which is really non-attachment in Buddhism, which is really being able to separate yourself from your money. Yes. And that's the only yes. thing that got me through in my business, mm -hmm. I thought it was going to have to file bankruptcy, but by having some healthy emotional separation, mm -hmm. I was able to compartmentalize those worries and move forward. And so mm -hmm. these skills help us in so many different ways and they can help our relationships as well. Absolutely. You know, it's, it's because money is so taboo, we're so avoidant that yes, if, 
if we can learn how to speak around mo about money, I call the conversations with money, courageous money conversations, because it takes courage to say to your spouse, hey, I think we're spending a little too much. I think we need to be, we should be putting a little more money towards savings. That's a courageous money conversation, going to your boss and saying, you know, I'm bringing so much value to this company. I'm wondering what it's going to take for me to get a, an increase in my salary. Those are courageous money conversations. And so many of us, you know, either avoid them or, you know, do them with a lot of, with, with with a lot of unnecessary or unhelpful emotion. Absolutely. And money is one of the top reasons that couples experience conflict yeah. and split yeah. up or divorce. So it's critical to have these money conversations and yes, to be empowered and to advocate for yourself with your employers and be creative and really, you know, expand your life. When we have more, we can help more. All of this conversation is not about materialism or excess or greed. When we are financially well, we can take better care of ourselves, our loved ones, our communities. We can be philanthropists. We can give to charities. So as my business recovered, I was able to employ more people and offer pro bono services. So uh, if guilt is in your way, uh, attendees, you know, ask that to step aside and look at how you're limiting yourself with self-limiting beliefs or scarcity mindset and how working programs like Spencer's and mine and the Sounds True money course that starts tomorrow, and you can watch the videos mm -hmm. later if you don't uh, join right away, can really help you. So we're moving into the time that I'd love for you all to put questions in the comments that Spencer can answer. And uh, while we do that, I'd like to ask you, Spencer, which of your books and programs are you most proud of and why? Well, um, my the, the book I wrote, The Cure for Money Madness, that was about 10 years ago. And I'm actually working on a new book right now, but it's going to be sort of uh, taking that book and infusing it with everything I've learned over the last 10 years. So I'm super excited about that. Um, probably bringing more of this deeper, um, the benefits of this deeper meditation practice that I've done in the last 10 years to everyone. I mean, my belief is that I can share the, what I've learned with everyone so that you don't need to do the, the weeks or months of meditation practice that I've done. You can benefit from the, 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 the skills that I'm going to offer in this new book. Uh, and then I have a, um, a program called Fearless Finance. Um, that's a weekly program that you can find out more on, about that on my website. And of course, I'm in the inner dimensions of money with uh, Joyce uh, at Sounds True. Uh, and I also teach a mindful advisor treat for, for professionals, for accountants, uh, lawyers, therapists, and financial advisors. It's a 24-hour, no-device retreat uh, in Northern California, and it's all about cultivating these mind states that are going to lead to more financial and business success. Amazing, Spencer, and congratulations. And you're helping, you know, in your bio, it says that you're helping all your financial advising clients, but you're also helping all of your readers and listeners and attendees of your retreat. So thank you for all the good work that you're doing in the world. Mm. And of course, again, I'm so grateful that you endorsed my book, The Financial Mindset yes, Fix, great. a fitness program for an abundant life. Thank you. Your book's amazing. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. I feel like it's my baby. I'm sure you mm. feel the same. Yeah. I really believe it's my life's work to remove the shame and stigma around mental really health cool. and financial health struggle yeah. and empower people to align their gifts with a need in the world and support them through healing and recovery and learning to thrive and prosper and move into the flow of abundance. I, I get very excited about it and I love mm -hmm. helping others. And my program is a book with exercises and couples complete it together as well. I'm hoping my next book will be about couples and money and mm -hmm. how to 
how to have the conversations that I've seen occur in so many of the couples that I've counseled. So now I'd like for us to move into the Q&A. So I am going to pull up the chat that we have uh, going on here. And Spencer, if you see any questions in there that you feel like you can go ahead and answer, please go ahead and do that. Okay. Well, I'll say that, um, that uh, thank you, Lydia, for commenting that you start your day with meditation. Again, I think that the anchor of meditation, it brings a certain stillness so that we can enter the world, the business world, the, the work world, the money world, which is so often frenetic. So it's the, it's the counterpoint to all that. So I love that you're doing that. Um, it, it helps me as well. And then Jason, you say, how do you get a partner on board with using mindfulness in our financial life? How do you get a partner on board? I assume um, you're, well, I'll answer, you know, whether it's a romantic partner or a business partner. Um, I think it's, it's mostly by you modeling the, the, the mindfulness that has informed your life. I think that's the way, way to get on board. I think that you could also, you know, instead of using the term mindfulness or meditation, uh, which are turnoffs to some people or some people just don't resonate with it, you can just say, can we just take a pause? Or, you know, when you're like, if, if you're a couple or, or you're a business partnership and you want to spend money on something, you can say, can we just, what if we wait three days before we purchase that. I mean, that is like a mindfulness pause to just like, let's sleep on it and reconsider this tomorrow. Um, I think that's a way to start getting your partner on board with kind of slowing things down. Um, I think the other thing is to mindfulness is so much about being with the truth of things instead of our perceptions of things, our judgments of things. And I think, you know, to get your partner on board with what actually are the numbers, how are you really doing, not your story about how you're doing, but the actual, um, you know, the actual um, sit financial situation that you're facing, what's coming, what are the expenditures coming up? I think all of that to me is in the realm of mindfulness to have that, um, have that awareness of both what's coming up in the next few days or a week, what's coming up in the next month or year. Um, and then the other thing that Joyce and I alluded to is when things are going, you know, crazy with ups and downs, or maybe, you know, one of you just lost a job or your business has a, has a setback is to pull out a chart or to show how far you've come. And I think that mindfulness can stump is very good at giving us that, kind of 30,000 foot view, that broader view that helps relax our nervous systems and gets us out of focusing on the micro movements of what's happening in this, you know, from day to day where we're going to see much more fluctuation in our lives. You know, it's sort of like, you know, our romantic relationships. Can you imagine if you, if you analyzed every single moment in your marriage that is not a happy marriage, but looking at it over 10 years, you have a whole different perspective on it. Absolutely. I love that, Spencer. And I'd like to share with the attendees that when you and I were backstage before we went live, my mind chatter was going to asking you questions about our event tomorrow. And you very kindly said, could we take a moment for silence? Mm -hmm. and just be together and meditate for a second and breathe and how helpful that was to get recentered and we we each stated our intentions and i think mm -hmm. couples can use that business partners yeah. can use that i know in my mindfulness in the workplace trainings i spoke for boeing and we did a meditation and an intention before the meeting and the attendees found it so helpful that they decided to start all their meetings with a short meditation. Did, did you call it a meditation? I did. Okay, I did. so you, the things are really changing in the world. So maybe you can even use that term. Ten years ago, it was it was considered like a kind of a woo-woo kind of term out there. But I think it's so 
mindfulness, you know, in itself has become like, unfortunately, like this big business in some ways, but this, the tools, the, the, um, the technology of mindfulness is so powerful. I think it's, it's in every major corporation just about today. Um, they have mindfulness programs. Um, yeah. So I think that's great. It's just taking that moment. And then the other mindfulness thing I was going to add in Joyce and is with, and with couples, this is great with businesses is a gratitude practice is yeah. just mentioning, asking your spouse, what are you grateful for about our finances, about our lives saying that when things are really great, when things are not so great, uh, that will help you not focus on the fact that your profit margin at work went down this year, uh, or you noticing that what, you know, your personal finances took a hit this year because one of you lost a lot of income is to, is to practice that gratitude is another mindfulness practice. Absolutely. My spouse, we had a rough patch there with our children, our adultlings, as I like to call them. Mm, like and he suggested that we go for a walk. And he said, let's practice some gratitude. And he's like, our kids are alive. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes it's very simple, yes. but it really can reroute our brain from fear and negativity. That's, that's it. Because when you do that, you can access the common sense that each of us has in abundance. That's it. Yes, yes absolutely. Absolutely. I love that. And you're right. Companies like Nike and Google and Johnson & Johnson have major mindfulness programs. And even small businesses have Zen rooms and mindfulness rooms where people can go and meditate. Uh, more companies are bringing in people to do yoga I see a lot of corporate subscriptions to Headspace and Calm and other meditation apps. So, are you saying, Joyce, that I don't have to be shy or be feel shame about that meditation is such a big part of my life? Right, it's cool now, Spencer. Oh, great, I'm finally yeah. cool. I love it. <laughs> well, I wouldn't go that far. No, <laughs> just joking. No, you're, you're very cool. And, I appreciate that. So I hope that if there's any other questions that people mm. post those in the comments and we are wrapping up here, but we have, um, as I mentioned, Spencer and I are both going to share some resources. I'm going to share some information about my speaking, my coaching, my digital course and book, um, as well as some information about the Sounds True Inner Dimensions of Money course that Spencer and I have been discussing. And Spencer, I'm sure you're going to share about all of the retreats and programs that you offer as well. Yes, definitely. Yeah, I have one coming up November 1st. Um, and if you're interested in that, is it, well, maybe we'll just put that. Is it better to just put that in the chat later? We'll just put that in, in the notes later. We'll put all the uh, details of how to get in touch with us uh, for things. But yeah, look, hope. I look forward to, to maybe seeing some of you on November 1st and 2nd in Northern California. Awesome. Um, and are you taking new financial advising clients? I know yes. you've got a so, lot of advisors. Yeah. So the company I started, Abacus, we are kind of an unusual um, advisory firm in that we, don't, we have much lower minimums than most. And we also do a lot of pro bono. We are dedicated to every advisor oh. doing a lot of pro bono each year. So if you're needing... Um, a sort of financial checkup, you, you want a sounding board, you can call us for that. And yes, we are taking on clients as well. Beautiful. That's mm -hmm. awesome. And as we wrap up here, is there anything else that you would like to share that we didn't discuss? You know, the only thing I always think is you mentioned the word compassion, and I don't think I could leave without saying that that is so powerful. It saved my life that that practice of compassion I have found has been the best thing to soften, loosen some of those fixed beliefs that were so that ingrained in this mind growing up, like that belief that I grew up with that money is more important than anything. It took a daily compassion practice over months to start to soften that. And my, my sense is that we don't, we don't need to get rid of a belief and I don't even know if you can, I have still have that belief in me that money is the most important thing, but compassion has softened it to the point where I now have 
the ability to choose what I'm going to do in my life. I'm not, I'm not so reactive to that belief as I used to be. So I just want to put that out there that if you have a belief like I'm not good with money or I can't earn more than X dollars a year, as Joyce mentioned, compassion can be such a powerful tool to healing that, that belief. Absolutely. And I myself, some of my belief systems were, you know, I'm bad if I spend money, um, shame around even costing money. And I think that sometimes what I've noticed, I would say healthy self-esteem is midway between diva and doormat and uh, healthy self-esteem is in the middle. The doormats kind of, we don't value ourselves and don't advocate, negotiate. We may be under earners and the divas and dudes can be divas too, um, can overspend and live beyond our means. So when we wrap ourselves with self-compassion, we recognize that we are a normal response to our nature and nurture, and we become aware of that self-talk, we can use methods like CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, or narrative therapy, and mindfulness strategies, strategies to reroute this. So lots of love in the comments. And Spencer, I'm so grateful to you for your time and your expertise. I could talk to you forever. I, I love marrying these fields. You know, it's what got me into this. You know, it was at business school where I found a course on financial planning and it was like perfect because I love what you do. I love the psychology around money. I think it's so powerful. Uh, and then, you know, the combining with something that a lot of us struggle with, I think is just great. So I'm really glad we're doing this. Look forward to more Joyce. Awesome. Do you have any final wishes for the attendees? What do you wish for them? Mm. My wish is engagement is it's been so long, so many years for so many of us of avoidance or just staying in fantasy or rumination about money. And I'm talking about real engagement where you start to, where it's not, it's A, you have this potential of really in becoming more financially secure, more financially well, but it's also this opportunity for massive personal growth that the, the darkness around money is a source for all of us or a springboard for all of us for our own um, personal spiritual growth as well. So emotional growth. I mean, this is working with money for me has been an, an amazing way to increase my emotional intelligence. So there's just so many benefits that can come from this engagement. And so there's many ways to engage. And, you know, we, Joyce and I have these different programs, including the Sounds True program that are easy ways to start engaging um, and make this, make it really fun for you to engage. So it's not a burden in your life. It becomes really exciting. I love that engagement because I spent too much of my life being avoidant and mm. many people fear, feel shame and anxiety. And when we practice that self-compassion, we honor ourselves and we know that financial self-care is a way we practice self-love. And we access support and we take the reins of our financial life, it can be transformative in so many ways. And so that's my wish for everyone. And I thank you, Spencer, for supporting all the attendees and spread the word, folks, because this LinkedIn Live will live on LinkedIn for a while so others can view it if you think they'd benefit. Share it with them. So Spencer, where can people find you? Yeah, so um, you can get in touch with me at spencer-sherman.com, spencer-sherman.com. If you do a forward slash free, you'll get to my free resources page. Um, you can also get in touch with my, the company I founded, abacuswealth.com, abacus, like the adding machine, abacuswealth.com. And um, yeah, on the spencer-sherman.com, you'll find the information about the Mindful Advisor Retreat there. Amazing. Yeah. Thank you so much, Spencer. You, Great to see you. And I'll see you tomorrow. Great, Joyce. Bye right. to everyone. Fantastic. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.